episode in our series on English medieval mysticism. My name is Charlie Reader and this is the most embarrassing thing I've done all time. Now the purpose of this documentary will be investigating a particular poem, uh, The Cloud of Unknowing, uh, particularly looking at the tension between apophatic and cataphatic voices. Now these are big terms and if they're not quickly defined it might cloud any knowing of this poem at all. Maybe we'll see why that's a good thing. However for the purpose of this documentary I thought it'd be best to, uh, to unpack some of these terms. So I visited a good friend of mine at Oriel College who's studying philosophy and theology to help us out. Millen, thanks so much for being on the show. Pleasure. Um, now, we've got some terms on our hands. We've got apophatic theology uh, and cataphatic theology. Um, would you mind just explaining these terms for us, please? Right, yeah, I, I can try. Um, let's see. Apophatic theology, um, or what's sometimes called negative theology, is characterised by the describing of God through negative statements. Um, we express that which we know about God just through negative statements. By contrast, cataphatic theology is typically characterised by the describing of God through positive statements. Um, that's the primary way in which we talk about him and express propositions about him. Does that help? Very helpful, thanks. Yeah. Well, would you mind maybe giving an example of one of these, let, let's say, apophatic theology? Sure. Um, I, uh, let's see, Charlie, how do we know that this documentary is cheesy? Well, we know it's not professional. Thanks for that, Menon. Um, now that we've defined those terms, uh, let's head to the cloud. The cloud of our knowing works as a kind of uh, spiritual handbook to hesychastic prayer in the Middle Ages. Now, I'd like to argue in this documentary that the cloud author constantly elevates a mode of um, apophatic theology, um, de-emphasising the, the role of intellectual labour and study, um, and surrendering the mind to the gap of knowledge that is betwixt thee and thy God, namely the cloud of unknowing. Now the cloud author sets out the intention in the early stages of the work. He describes how others travail in thy wits, and how they feign a manner of working. They try to attain a knowledge of God through intellectual labour and study, and doing so, they do ill to their imagination. The cloud author warns us against this, saying, Beware in that this work, and travail not in thy wits, nor in thine imagination on no wise, encouraging us yet again to surrender to this spiritual darkness. Now what sort of darkness are we talking about here? A physical darkness? A physical cloud? Well, the cloud author clarifies it for us. He says, don't even think that I'm talking about a physical cloud or a physical darkness. That's something that you can imagine. That's something tangible. Rather, the cloud author says this, for when I say darkness, I mean a lack of knowing, as all that thing that thou knowest not, or else that thou hast forgotten. It is dark to thee, for thou seest it not with thy ghostly eye. The main decree the cloud author asserts in his poem is to pursue love over thought. When describing God, he says, he may well be loved, but not thought, saying that it's potentially blasphemous to try to fully understand God. Instead, he said we should smite upon that thick cloud of unknowing with a sharp dart of longing love. A phrase that's repeated a lot throughout the cloud. He bids us to receive no other thought of God, only that he made us and ransomed us, and that he's called us to this exercise. He says that it suffices enough, uh, a naked intent directed towards God, saying that a simple reaching out, a naked intent directed towards God is enough. Stunning, isn't it? Now, the cloud author uses aspects of Walter Hilton's work, The Mixed Life, um, to argue that the higher part of contemplative life lies in this cloud of unknowing, in this blind beholding of God. He also uses um, Luke 10 um, to assert this idea as well. Um, he uses the, the story of um, Mary and Martha. Um, this is a short account in the Gospels where um, Martha is busying around the house and um, doing all the work. Um, whilst Mary is simply sitting at the feet of Jesus, um, listening to him. Um, after Martha expresses her distress at their differences in workload, um, 
Jesus actually says to her that Mary had chose the better option. The cloud author summarises this for us by saying, For by Mary is understood in all contemplatives, for they should conform their living after hers, and by Martha actives on the same way. Surely by negating the role of knowledge, you inevitably engage with it. Sadly, I think that's the case for the cloud of unknowing. By setting out the apophatic aim, by saying what we should beware of, the author inevitably enters the cataphatic realm. Thank you very much for that. We'll, okay. we'll catch up with that later. Pleasure. Thanks so right. much. Bye-bye. Sure, yeah. Now, let me just give examples of um, that uh, cataphatic and, um, you, you know, uh, role of negation. Bye-bye. Um, I think the kind of unknowing sort of examples of that um, <laughs> covers... <laughs> Sorry, old friend, minor interruption. Uh, now, I was talking about the, the examples of this. Now, um, obviously, the, the author calls us to assess um, each thought, to know if it's sinful or not, but uh, surely assessing the thought um, hinders that apophatic aim of unknowing and invoking it. Um, the author um, gives us spiritual tactics um, to help the beginner, um, you know, suggesting that perhaps one way of overcoming um, the thoughts is uh, just accepting an, an ignorance that they're not there. Although, is it possible to truly pretend that thoughts aren't there? Again, the author um, calls us to fill thy spirit with the ghostly meaning of the word sin, but not induce any actual sins, whether it be venial or deadly. Uh, pride, wrath, or envy. But again, in the moment, this troubles the notion of a completely apathetic state by invoking such sins to avoid. So are these terms too idealistic then? Is there such a thing as a truly apophatic text? Well, there's only one that's ever been composed um, and it's stored here in the, in the Bodleian um, and it's an enormous privilege to, to actually have it here on the show to show you. And um, so, here we go. Here it is. Here it is. Um, the complete apophatic text. Um, it says nothing and it invokes nothing. Now, jokes aside, it does raise an important argument over whether the intentions of this text are actually fulfilled. Perhaps it's best to say then that the author invites the reader to participate in a cataphatic spiritual experience through the affirmative strategies that appeal to the senses. But then in doing this, the author quickly shifts the reader back to the spiritual unknown, leaving the reader with the same mystical oblivion that we began with. I've been Charlie Reader. Thanks to Christian, thanks to Millen, and thank you for watching. Bye-bye.